morning out there, isn't it? Yeah. It's like so calm. Well, we have another wonderful lecture, so how about a nice round of applause for Ross Arnold? Thank you all, and thank you for being here again this morning. It's always exciting when people come back. Um, and I, I have to acknowledge a mistake I made yesterday, and some of you were scratching your head, and a couple of people asked me. In the course of my talk, I mentioned Friday the 13th as being the day that the Templars were suppressed and it became legendary that that was the reason Friday the 13th was, un was unlucky. And I said, Carolyn and I were born on Friday the 13th. Well, since yesterday was our birthday, people were going, now wait a minute. Friday the 13th was our anniversary, not our birthday. That's, that, that's I used the wrong word. Carolyn always makes a joke that uh, we have the same birthday and we have the same anniversary. Who would have thought? Um, so, so anyway, this morning we are going to be talking about Faith and culture in the ancient Near East. Are you waving for me? I am. Oh, hi. I thought he was inviting me to come and sit back there. I took that as a bad sign. Um, so today we are talking about uh, faith and culture in the ancient Near East. And I'm, I'm doing a head fake um, on our dear friend Travis, who has been so gracious. This afternoon, I, as I was putting together the final notes on this, I had my talks prepared, but I'm still tweaking images and things like that. I decided it made more sense this afternoon for us to go ahead and do the section on the children of Abraham. Because today, I'm going to be talking about a number of different religious belief systems that grew up in the ancient Near East, uh, many of which carried on to modern times. And in the process, I'm going to be introducing Judaism, Christianity and Islam. I am not going to be getting into the faith aspects, in other words, what they believe. This morning, I'm just going to be talking about the history of how they, they began and sort of began to develop the major parts of them. Um, and then this afternoon, I'm, I'm going to get into a little bit more of that this afternoon, particularly on Islam, but I'll talk more about the faiths. What are the belief systems of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? How did they develop? How are they similar? And how do they differ? This morning I'm entirely dealing with sort of the history of it and how the development of these religious faiths is a reflection of the culture and the history that, uh, that they found themselves in. Um, as, as I looked at before, and I'll keep referring back to this, this is the description of the Footsteps of Faith Cruise, and it includes the statement that we're going to follow the footsteps of religion throughout the ages. Well, we, that's, that's sort of what we want to do today and talk about the history of the major religious movements as related to the region we're in and the culture. Now, this is a list of all of the major world religions. Now, there are obviously there are a lot of religions. There are some religions that are like one person. We don't have all those listed. But <laughs> these are the major religions in terms of size, largest down of those that are listed as major religions. And I've thrown in there other and non-religious as the world uh, thinks more of itself, more and more people say they don't have any religious belief. There has never been a culture in the history of humankind that has not had some religious belief, some belief in the supernatural, something greater than themselves. But today in modern times we do have about 1.1 billion people who say they don't believe in anything. All right, well, just wait till somebody forces them to be in a war or something and they may change their mind about that. But Christianity is the largest faith in the world today. About a third, uh, slightly less than a third of the world's population uh, count themselves as Christian, 2.1 billion. 1.5 billion consider themselves Islamic, part of the Muslim faith. Uh, Hinduism is about 900 million. Chinese traditionalism, um, and that includes Confucianism, Taoism, Shamanism, the traditional Chinese faiths I've lumped together, about 394 um, a billion, a million people, then Buddhism, Sikhism, Judaism, Baha'ism, Jainism, etc. I am not going to, on this cruise, if you'd like to talk to me about it individually, I'm happy to, but I'm not going to do any talks about the Asian religions because that's not where we are and that's not what our focus is. If you want to think of the religions in terms of how old they are, which are the earliest of the world religions, the oldest one is Hinduism, which began sometime between, depending on how you count it, 4,000 and 2,500 BC. The second oldest of the world religions is Judaism, which um, began somewhere around 2,000 BC with the birth of Abraham. In some ways, you could say Christianity and Islam started there, since they are Abrahamic religions. 
but more specifically in terms of age, you then get to Buddhism, Chinese traditional religions, Shinto and Jainism. One of the things I point out to this that's quite interesting, you will notice that Buddhism, the Chinese traditional religions, especially Confucianism and Taoism, and Shinto and uh, Jainism all started within about 100 years of each other. The period right around 500 BC was this explosion of Asian, especially Asian religions. If, do we have any, any evolutionary biologists in the group? No? <laughs> okay. Um, in, in evolutionary biology, the, there is a, they've noticed that there are periods of time in evolution where there were explosions of new um, animal life especially. For instance, there's an, a period called the Cambrian Explosion, about 450 million BC, that almost all of what we think of as animal life occurred within a relatively short period of time. In fact, it's so common in, in biology that they, call, they have a name for it. It's called uh, punctuated equilibrium. Well, the fact is that when you talk about culture and religious development, there also is a phenomenon which we might call punctuated equilibrianism, which, which means there are periods of time in which a lot of stuff happened in a relatively short period. When you think about the fact that Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, uh, Shinto and Jainism all occurred within about a hundred years of each other. That's pretty amazing, right? And, and most of them independent of each other. Um, then, of course, Christianity came along right about 30 AD, and then Islam, then Sikhism, which, which I will mention briefly. Sikhism is sort of a, a, a blend or a, a combination of Islam and Hinduism. And this list goes back to the largest to smallest, but the highlighted ones, the one in orange, are the ones that uh, we're going to be talking about a little bit, but particularly the ones that, that occurred in the ancient Near East. Uh, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism I'm not going to talk about, but because but it was founded in India, but it came after Islam, and it is kind of a merging or a combination of um, Islam and Hinduism. I've, I've listed it here because it, Judaism, and Baha'ism all are monotheistic religions. So the ones highlighted in orange are all monotheistic. That's the Sikhism took from Islam their belief in one God, but then they added a lot of other kinds of beliefs from, from Hinduism as well. But we are going to be focusing in terms of our discussion today. First, we're going to be talking about um, the, the Mesopotamian uh, polytheism, and I've referred to that as primitive polytheism. And when you look at the images I'm going to have, you'll sort of understand why we call that a primitive polytheism. Um, these are the religions that grew up in the Fertile Crescent, that is uh, the area of Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers of Euphrates and Tigris. Um, and you'll see differences in the symbolism and representation from that religion versus some of the others. We will then look at Egyptian polytheism, which I have called the more sophisticated polytheism. Then Greek and Roman polytheism. Now, Greece and Rome technically are not in the ancient Near East, but Greek and Roman religions very much influence certain periods of time in this region. And so when we talk about religious development in this area, we have to talk about Greek and Roman uh, religious polytheism because that affected a lot of what was going on here. We are then going to look at the very interesting ancient mystery religions, which came out of the Greco-Roman uh, period and uh, influence because fascinating uh, sense of why those occurred and what they were, the, the uh, sects or cults of Mithras, of uh, Sibylle, Attis, uh, various others we'll talk about. Then we want to look at the rise of monotheism or ethical monotheism as sometimes called. First Judaism, the first great monotheistic religion, then Christianity which came out of Judaism, and then Islam, which saw itself as a corrective religion or corrective faith to both um, Judaism and Islam. And along with, uh, along with uh, Islam, I will briefly mention Baha'ism. I'm especially mentioning that because when we reach Israel and, and stop in Haifa, one of the options for you is to visit the Baha'i Center in Haifa, which is the center of all of Baha'ism. Baha'i started in Persia. But the, the followers of Baha'i were not accepted by Islam uh, because they proposed there was a new prophet. And one of the basic principles of Islam is Muhammad was the last prophet. And there's no more revelation after Muhammad. Well, Baha'ism said there was. So the Baha'is were driven out of Persia. They ended up in England for a while, were sort of driven out of England, and they ended up in Israel. 
And that's why Haifa is the center of Baha'ism. It's a lot of places. And Baha'ism is known. I'm giving you this part of the talk already. Um, I just get up here and, and, and wing it. You know, if I don't know something, I'll make it up. But um, Baha'ism is well known for the buildings. Have you all seen any of the Baha'i temples around the world? They're extraordinary. All of them. Uh, in terms of the architecture. They're amazing things, and that's one of the things they're known for. But their center, the Baha'i Center and the, the Court of Baha'i is in Haifa, and they have an extraordinary center there with gardens. And for some of you, you may wish to visit that. That's one of the options on the trip, okay? So that's where we're going today. I'm, I don't promise you I'm going to finish at 1130, because I can never promise that. I don't know how. <laughs> I will try to finish on time. If I get to 1130 and you all are hungry or you need to do something else, I am not offended if you get up and leave. I'm also not offended if you fall asleep. I'm a preacher, and I always say, you know, if somebody falls asleep when I preach, I don't mind. In fact, if they need the rest and I can help, I'm happy to help. Okay? <laughs> so this is, a, this is a very informal kind of setting. You all just be comfortable. If you need to get up and leave, go to the bathroom, get something to eat, whatever you need to do, that's fine. All right, let's talk about the primitive polytheism of Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, the, the site of the original human cultures and, and civilization, and by that, maybe I shouldn't say culture, the original civilization. Civilization is defined as where they built cities, because cities were the sign of the fact that they had planted crops that needed to be taken care of. They weren't wandering around as hunter-gatherers anymore. It's where you had a, a, the first divisions of labor. This person is really good at making ceramic pots, so he's going to make pots. Um, this person is going to be a, a field laborer. This person is going to, you know, different responsibilities. Cities were when that all happened. And so Mesopotamia is where some of the earliest gatherings of cities, um, not necessarily the first city in history, but the first place where we have a number of cities developing. Now within Mesopotamia, there, the Mesopotamian religion, there literally were hundreds of thousands of deities. Now, don't be shocked by that. It is polytheistic. In fact, in Hinduism, there's a statement in Hinduism that Hinduism has 300 million gods. Well, in effect, in Hinduism, that's what this, it's actually a pantheistic religion, meaning everything is God. And they just give it different, different manifestations of God, different names. And so the, by saying 300 million deities, they mean there's a lot of them. Well, there were hundreds of thousands of deities within Meso ancient Mesopotamia. And they particularly were related to... Um, the experiences people had of the natural world. All right? I mentioned to you that Mesopotamia grew up around the rivers. It, the, the name means the land between the rivers, uh, the, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Well, one of the aspects of living in those rivers, this is a very flat area. You can tell here there are mountains to the north, there's desert to the south, but this is all flat river bottom land. Well, what would happen is, um, you know, flat area, you have a lot of sky. And so there's a sense of the awesomeness of the sky. Um, it, the moon and the sun were very evident. Frequently the moon was more focused on than the sun in primitive ancient religions. Why would that be? Can you look at the sun? No. But you can look at the moon. And so the moon always felt a little friendlier. And often the moon goddess um, was more important to people than the sun god, although the sun was seen as power. There also was a major focus on elements like the river waters. There were goddesses of fresh water. And particularly in Mesopotamia, they had the difficulty. Everything in Mesopotamia is just flat and it's mud. Before they started inventing irrigation, there was the potential for growth, but there was not a lot of trees and plants and forests. And so the river was seen as the source of life, and so it was deified. I mean, there was a goddess of the river. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Also, periodically in this flat area, because of rains in the mountains in the north, the Zagros Mountains, uh, in, the, in the Taurus Mountains, they would have these floods that would rip through, that would destroy everything. And so there's the awesome power that they were afraid, and so there was an effort to identify and deify the power of the storms and the power of the gods in the mountains. Why do you think that the mountains have almost always been the site of pagan gods? You know, the gods of Olympus? is because the mountains were stuff that was where stuff were happening that then affected us down here in the lowlands. That's where the storms were, because they could see them in the mountains, and then we end up with a flood that kills people. And so the idea of gods in the mountains, of the god of the river, of the god of the storm, a god of the sky, which is so awesome, and particularly, most important, and the one that people have the most affection for, is the mother goddess, who was seen as the goddess of fertility. 
So within this geography, the very geography itself, not only in Mesopotamia, but in much of the pagan world, ended up being the source of their various gods because it's what they could see, what they could experience, and especially the powers that were around them, the sound of thunder. We, we, we have so much noise around us today, we don't realize that the loudest noise that ancient people ever heard was thunder. Beyond that, cracking two rocks together was the loudest noise you're going to hear. And so, thunder gods and the gods of the sky were very significant. So, the things that people saw, the power they experienced, is where they developed their conception of gods, okay? One of the most important of those gods was the mother goddess, the goddess of fertility, the goddess of, of birth, the goddess of plant growth, because fertility came, they came to understand, if you don't have babies, then your family and tribe dies. If you don't grow food, your family and tribe dies. So fertility and the fertility goddess, or the mother goddess, as she was first called, was probably the most important of the gods. Not necessarily the most powerful, but the one they were most concerned about. This image right here, the upper left, is reputedly the oldest known human artifact of any kind. This is believed to be between have been created between 22,000 and 24,000 BC, as much as 26,000 years ago. The oldest known human artifact. And what is it? That's, that's the way everybody's girlfriend looked back then. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is the image of the mother goddess, the goddess of fertility. She's fat because it means there's a lot of food available. All right? The center panel on the top, they have hundreds of these images of fat ladies frequently showing their breasts because that was what they fed their children with. Again, a sign of fertility and birth. The one on the upper right, this one, again, the fat uh, mother goddess, this one was found in um, Shatul Hayek. Shatul Hayek is a town in, um, some people believe may have been the oldest city ever built, and it is in Turkey, north of where we were yesterday. The guide on our bus pointed to Shatul Hayek, uh, Hayek, I'm sorry, and that is where that particular mother goddess statue came from. The lower right, these are images uh, of people worshiping that were found in an ancient, um, ancient Near East temple. So they would do representations of human beings worshiping, adoring the gods that the temples represented. It's also worth noting that that ancient temples are the most ancient of all buildings we have records of. People were building temples almost before they were building homes. And when we get to the empire section, I'll give you some images of some of the buildings and things back then. You also, in addition to the, to the mother goddess, the goddess of fertility, the lower left-hand side are some of the gods, this is from, again, the, um, the Mesopotamian area, some of the gods of nature. You'll notice the one in the middle is coming up out of the water. That is the river god because the river was so critical to their experience of life. So this is the, the, the major gods of, um, the idea of the, uh, the ancient gods of Mesopotamia. Now, usually the sky gods, the thunder god, the sky god, they were male. The fertility gods, the ones that had to do with giving birth, with growing plants, those were almost always female. Um, and much of this is what we would call animism. The idea in pagan cultures, ancient cultures, the reason there were thousands of deities is that nothing was considered inanimate. Rocks, mountains, rivers, plains, mud. There's a goddess of mud in Mesopotamia because mud was all they had. Why do you think all the ancient ziggurats and everything were made out of mud? Because they didn't have any stone. They had stone in Egypt, so they built stone pyramids. But in Mesopotamia, all they had was mud and reeds, so all of their, their bowls and everything else was made out of either reeds woven together or mud. Their buildings were made out of mud. How is it that you make bricks that last longer? You, you chop up reeds and put in them, right? You remember that in Egypt, one of the punishments the Pharaoh gave to the Israelites in Egypt was he made them make bricks without straw. In other words, they had to go make their own, cut their own straw in order to make the bricks stronger. That's all they had, and so these things became deified, animism. There is a spirit in everything. Even modern primitive religions often will be animistic. There are gods of the trees and of the mountains and of the rivers. 
And in many primitive cultures, including back then, the major fo one major focus of life is to try to keep the gods from being mad at you. And so you try to do something to satisfy them or cajole them or make them happy with you. Now this, I expect you to memorize this. I don't even expect you to see this. Um, but the point is, this is a listing of some of the later Mesopotamian gods and genealogy. If you do look at it more closely, you'll realize that there are gods appearing in the same, you know, same god in different places. It was a jumble. It was not as sophisticated and clearly delineated as the later Egyptian, Greek, and Roman gods, which is one of the reasons I call it primitive. But in the upper left-hand corner, the one I have circled here, that is what they call the goddess Namu, which was their proper name for the fertility goddess, the mother goddess. She is first on this list. The next name is Anu, who is the male sky god. So you see what's most important to them. Those were the two sources. If you come on down, um, the circle I have here is the god Marduk. You may have heard that. He, was the, he became the, the primary god of the Babylonians. But in the ancient Sumerian legend, Marduk is the one who created the world as we know it. The gods existed before. Marduk, it's kind of a complicated story. Tiamat, who uh, is up here, that one. Tiamat and her husband, um, they have children, and their children have children, and the grandchildren make so much noise that Tiamat and her husband can't get any sleep. And so they decide they're going to kill their, their, the gods who are their grandchildren. Well, their grandchildren find out. And so they get one of their children, Marduk, to, to kill uh, Tiamat. And he tears her apart. Part of Tiamat becomes the sky. Part of Tiamat becomes the horizon and part the earth. The blood of her consort husband is mixed with clay to make human beings. Human beings were made in order to be slaves, and those slaves were supposed to do all the work so the gods didn't have to. So they had a very clear, but all of that was before, you know, before or during the creation of the world. Um, also here, two other names you might recognize, Gilgamesh and Ishtar. Ishtar again became an ancient Assyrian and Babylonian goddess. Gilgamesh was a king slash god, and the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, about 2000 BC, is one of the oldest pieces of literature. I mean, I'm not talking just writing, but literature. It's an epic poem about this man, Gilgamesh, who has a good friend in Kidu. First they fight each other, then they become friends, and then it becomes a buddy movie. All right, they all they run around drinking together and fighting together and doing all sorts of stuff. And then the gods don't like the fact they're enjoying themselves, and so they cause Enkidu to get sick and die slowly. And Gilgamesh is confronted with the reality of human mortality. And the whole rest of the poem is him trying to find a solution to human mortality. And at the very end, he comes upon one of the cities of ancient Sumeria, ancient Mesopotamia, and he sees the city and he realizes Every person dies. The best we can do is leave something behind that's going to last longer than us. So it's actually a, a hymn of praise to cities because that's the thing that would last after people die. Again, this is over 4,000 years old, this epic. All right? So, and again, Ishtar was a goddess of the Sumerians, which got picked up by the Babylonians and the Assyrians and others here. You get the idea that they did have very clear delineations, but still pretty primitive in how that was represented. Um, these gods that I mentioned here include the goddess of the fresh water, the god of the overall waters, and the god of mud, because that's what they dealt with in their lives. Now, we turn now. Any questions about the Mesopotamian religions? Now that you've memorized that list I just had up there, we're good. All right, now let's turn to eat. You guys don't laugh much. Is that a problem? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll raise my right hand when it's a joke, so you'll know, okay? Let's turn to Egypt. Egypt, almost as old a civilization as Mesopotamia, but Egypt is different in one major regard. Well, it, it, in that regard is that Egypt continued as a civilization throughout uh, most of ancient history. In Mesopotamia, the cultures changed from one to the next, to the next, to the next. They went from the Sumerian to the Akkadian, to the early Babylonian, to the Hittite, to the late Babylonian, to etc. We're going to talk about that when we get to the birth, birthplace of empires. So they changed. Now, often they would adopt each other's gods, but there was not a continuity of history. Egypt is a, was a culture that continued from um, around the middle of the, the uh, third century BC until modern times. Egypt still exists. 
In fact, the importance of that continuity, now they did change dynasties. In fact, there are, there are three kingdoms, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom in Egypt. And there are distinctive historical pieces, but it was, and, and they had intermediate periods between, which were kind of dark ages. But still, as a culture, it was continuous. The importance of that is every other culture we can define the history of based upon what was happening at different times in Egypt. Because Egypt had a relationship with a lot of these countries. Uh, Egypt would frequently mention, you know, there, there was a king named, uh, named Ashurbanipal that we just had a fight with. Okay, now we know when Ashurbanipal lived because there's a consistency in the Egyptian history. That's very important, the, the continuous history of Egypt. Well, because they had a longer and more continuous history, they had more time to develop the perceptions of who their gods were and what they looked like and you know, how they acted and that sort of thing. The sun god, how many of you know the name of the sun god of Egypt? Ra. Ra! Okay, and um, in fact, Carolyn said we, always, we should get a bumper sticker that says, Isis, Isis, Ra, Ra, Ra! <laughs> Isis, Isis, my hands up. Yeah, that was a joke. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had a god of the desert and of chaos. Notice the desert is related to chaos. And that was the god Set, who was also the god of death. What happens if you go into the desert by yourself? Yeah. Death. Mm. Okay. Um, and only about 3% of the whole of Egypt was <laughs> inhabitable because that was the area around the River Nile. Outside that, there was chaos, there was death in the desert. They had the god of the sky, Horus. This god was especially related to the pharaohs. The pharaohs, the leaders of Egypt from the very earliest days, were considered themselves divine, or at least semi-divine. They were sort of the bridge between humanity and the gods. The pharaohs had one major responsibility. This is all they really had to do, and that was make sure the sun came up in the morning. <laughs> if the sun came up in the morning, the pharaohs were doing their job. Now, they ran the country, too, but that was the thing they were really counted on for. Uh, we had Isis, who was the mother goddess. Isis is, in, in some ways, associated with this mother goddess of fertility from Sumeria. Similar expectations and characteristics. You had the god of the Nile. Remember the river, the importance of the river. Hapi, the god of the Nile. You also had, how many cat people do we have here? Mm -hmm. No cat people? Yeah. Okay, good for you. I'm both. I'm a dog person and a cat person, so I don't, you know, so I hate myself. No. Uh, the, they had a goddess of cats, Bastet, as you may know. They also had uh, Anubis, who was the jackal god who looked like a dog. Carolyn and I have for some time now had Basinjis, which are ancient Egyptian dogs. They're the ones you've seen, curly tail, fox-like head, their head looks like Anubis. This was the god of the ancient pharaohs, given to them by primitive people. And so we've always had sort of an affinity for Anubis and, and that kind of thing. But they had very clear sense of who the gods were, what their names were, what they were responsible for, and even what they looked like. Some of the ones here in the upper right there is, um, is Ra, the sun god. The bottom center one is Horus, the sky god. Just above that is Hapi, the Nile god. To the right is Set, the god of chaos, of death, of the desert. Um, here is another representation of them from left to right on top is Horus, Set, Thoth, Num, Hathor, Hobek, Ra, Amun, Tha, Anubis, Osiris, and Isis. And if you want, you can even get action figures of your favorite Egyptian gods, which is what this is. So the Egyptians were very sophisticated in their polytheism. Now, there was one very interesting period of time in Egyptian history. This was during the 14th century BC in the New Kingdom. And this representation, this image represents on the right the god Amenhotep IV, who, all, who took the name Akhenaten, and his wife Nefertiti on the left, both of them playing with their children. The importance of Akhenaten is one of the gods, and it had been a minor god before Akhenaten's father, Amenhotep III, uh, the god Aten. Now, Ra was the sun god, but they had a sense in which the benefit that you get, but the warmth of the rays, they called it, the, the Aten was called the uh, god of the disk of the sun. Basically, Ra, Ra was the sun, but all of the benefit you get from it, the warmth, the light, everything else, they deified as Aten. And so um, Amenhotep III, the father of this guy, liked the god Aten. He created a priesthood for Aten, who'd been only a minor god before. He created temples for Aten. Well, then his son, Amenhotep IV, comes along. He, he tries to make Aten the one god that everybody worshipped. This is called the Amarna Rebellion, because Amarna was the town in Egypt where he set up the main temple to Aten. 
So this, and he changed his name to Aten, Aten, Aten being the god he wanted to worship. Now, he offended all of the priests of the other religions because he pretty much tried, made them redundant. He really tried to emphasize this, and, and a lot of people had a problem with it. As soon as he died, they reverted back to the old way. But this is the first real example we have in history of somebody trying to create an emphasis on one god as the primary god. Every culture has had a favorite god. In fact, every city in ancient civilization had a favorite god. You all were in Ephesus. What was the, the primary or favorite goddess of Ephesus? Artemis. Artemis. Artemis of the Ephesians. You were in Athens. What was the primary goddess of Athens? What was the Parthenon built as? Athena. Athena. It was the temple of Athena. Every city, and in fact every household, would have their own favorite god. But that didn't mean they didn't accept the other gods. When you believe that there are many gods, but you pick one that you think is the one to worship, the one that's most important, there's a name for that. It's called henotheism. Henotheism. In fact, it might be a shock to some of you that in the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament figures worshipped, apparently, acknowledged other gods. We have the example when Jacob runs off, his wife steals her father's household gods. And when they catch up with the caravan and say, you stole my household gods, and Jacob didn't know about it, he said, well, look around. If you find them, then, you know, fine. You can have everything I have. Well, they looked around, and, and Jacob's wife is sitting on a saddle in her tent where she had hidden the, the gods under the saddle, and she says, I'm having my period. I can't get up. Well, they couldn't touch her to move her because that would have made them unclean. And so they didn't find them. But that idea that even in the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament characters, there were other gods, the Ten Commandments start out, you know, with the, the statement that you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first of the Ten Commandments. You'll notice it doesn't say there are no other gods. In the people's perceptions, there probably were other gods. But the Ten Commandments said you will have no other gods before me. And what's the Second Commandment say? Anybody know? You will not make any idols, no graven images to worship. Well, why would they have made idols and graven images unless there was a tendency in those days to have other gods that they worshipped? So God, I mean, he convinced the Hebrews that he was the only God, but they tended to want to worship other gods too, partly because those may have been demons or angelic figures or whatever they were. So this idea of having one God that you focus on, even if others might exist, is called henotheism. And you bump into that a lot. That was the case with Akhenaten. He didn't say there weren't other gods. He said, we're going to focus on one. And that was true in virtually every city god that you got, etc. So this is a very sophisticated kind of understanding of polytheism, all right? Any questions about the Egyptians? I don't claim to be an Egyptologist or an expert on Egyptian religion. I know just enough to get myself in trouble. Um, we then come, again, we're moving out of the ancient Near East a little bit into Greece. Greece is right on the border here. But their religion did affect the ancient Near East because it was imported to the area we're looking at. The, the polytheism of Greece is a step even further in terms of sophistication over the Egyptians as it became more modern. The, the, the Greeks, one of the astonishing things is, at its height, the Greek Empire, if you will, or what's called the Athenian Empire because Athens really ran it, was, um, was really rather small. And it's especially small because this isn't the slide I thought I was looking at. Um, <laughs> the ancient Greek gods started with the Minoan and Mycenaean, especially the Mycenaean cultures. You're going to learn more about that later in our cruise because when we come to Crete, Crete was the home of the Minoan culture. We are going to land in uh, Monavasia and visit Sparta and Got some other places. Oh, we're not going to restart. It was bone forever. Um, Mycenae, which was centered in the city of Mycenae, which is right there, was the earliest really of the Greek um, the civilization. Now, it's hard even to say Greek civilization because the Greeks were always city-states. They were independent states that only tended to work together when they needed to. Um, then Mycenae invented, much like, uh, like they did in Mesopotamia and Egypt, the natural phenomena around them caused them to identify these forces as deities, powers. Power they couldn't control, things they didn't understand. It was an effort to try to gain some sense of, of understanding, if not control, over the environment they were in. 
And so then you get the Mycenaean ideas of divinities. And Poseidon, the god of the sea, was especially important to the Mycenaeans. Why do you think the Mycenaeans were really interested in the sea? <laughs> you know, what are they surrounded by? <laughs> so Poseidon was their primary god. They, some of those same deities were then adopted into more recent, like a thousand, just over a thousand years later, the golden age of Greece in the fifth century BC, uh, which is centered in, in, wrong button. Okay, uh, now you know all that stuff. Athens, right there. Athens was the main city. This is a period of time in which they refined their beliefs into what they call the 12 great gods of Olympus. They were Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, Apollo, Artemis, Aphrodite, uh, various others you've heard of. Okay? Now, those gods had all human characteristics. They looked human. In fact, this is frequently how they represented the images of the gods. This, and in this case, they lived on Olympus, you know, this pastoral scene, everybody's happy, there's all these cherubs flying around, Dionysus is pouring, or I'm sorry, Bacchus is pouring drinks for everybody, you know. Uh, it was a good time. The gods were perceived as being very much like humans, but humans could not approach the gods. You couldn't have a relationship with one of the gods, but the gods could decide if they wanted to have a relationship with you. And often the male gods did have a relationship with human women. Mm -hmm. and produced babies. Heracles, or Hercules, we call him, was, was thought to be the son of Zeus by a woman named Alomene. And so the gods could relate to humans, even in physical terms, and the, the Greek gods loved to give humans a hard time just to see how they acted. I mean, it's like putting ants on a hot plate. Let's see how they dance. The Greek gods did that to humans a lot. and But these gods of Olympus were personified. And most important to the Greeks were the representation of their local gods. The lower left is the Parthenon, which was built to Athens. And of course, the picture at the top is a night scene that I took um, a couple years ago of the Parthenon, the temple to Athena Nike, Athena Victorious, some of the other temples that are on top. The lower right hand is a, is a reproduction model, scale model, it's not full size, of the temple to Artemis. So Greek temples, when you think of Greek culture, you either think of naked men with discs in their hands, or even more likely probably you think of this, their temples. This is what represented Greek culture because their gods were so critically important to them. Well, it was fairly isolated at first. It was that little line of you know, uh, area, what we think of as Greece, plus the Ionian strip on uh, Asia Minor, Turkey, Anatolia, that they controlled after the, the Trojan War. Our guy talked about that a little bit yesterday. After they won the Battle of Troy, Greece ended up controlling that strip of land along the coast. That was called Ionia. Well, this was all fairly limited until Alexander comes along. And Alexander the Great, who was actually not Greece, in those days Macedonia and Greece were not the same. What we, what, what, where he lived is now part of what we know of as Greece. But he spoke Greek. He, he believed in the Greek gods and Greek culture. And so when Alexander the Great in the 300s BC left Macedonia, first he conquered all of the Greece, you know, he and his father. Then he took off. He, he wandered through all of Asia Minor, winning battles there, and those battles were against the Persian Empire. We'll talk about that under the birthplace of empires. And we'll talk about Alexander in more detail. He conquered all the way through Syria, down through the Levant, Israel as we know it, down to Egypt, and Egypt, he made a special uh, pilgrimage. You'll notice, you see this right here, this little point? He went to a very remote desert temple, which was in a place called uh, Ziwa. It was the temple of Zeus Ammon. And at the temple of Zeus Ammon, because there had been a rumor, and I think um, Alexander's mother, Olympia, encouraged this rumor, that he actually was the son of Zeus. Olympia saying, well, Zeus came to see me, Al, this is why you're so great, because you're the son of Zeus. Well, the more battles he won, the more invincible he seemed, the more that Alexander started thinking of that about himself. So he went to this oracle at the temple of Siwa, which was the temple of Zeus Ammon, combination, Zeus and Ammon, a Greek, uh, uh, Egyptian god, and the oracle there declared that he was divine. He was the divine Alexander, the son of Zeus, 
And from that point on, he was known as the son of Zeus, the son of Ammon. And the only real problems, other than the fact that he kept him out for like 10 or 11 years marching in, you know, into the wilderness, um, the only real problem that he ever had, that Alexander ever had with his troops, was when he started pushing the fact that he was divine and they should worship him. And some of these very strong Macedonian military guys were going, not so much, Al, we knew you when you were this tall. Okay? And so he ran into problems. But there was this idea that everywhere he went, he not only advocated that he was divine, but he spread the belief in the Greek gods. And those beliefs went all the way through um, Iran, Iraq, all the way over into India, Bactria, you know, all of these places. He was building temples to Greek gods, caught, forcing people to speak Greek, Incursing, uh, encouraging the Greek culture, and this is why, as I say, even though Greece is not part of the ancient Near East, all of this region and much further um, east than this even, we get the Greek influence and the Greek temple and the Greek pantheon, all right? Any questions about those Greeks? We'll talk about the empire and Alexander later. Then we come to Rome. This is slightly different than the other image I gave you, but this is what the Roman Empire looked like uh, close to its height. It surrounded the whole of the Mediterranean, and the Roman Empire had their own pantheon of gods. Their, their number one god was Jupiter, his wife was Hera, and on down, okay? Now, everywhere they went, they would share those gods, but the Romans, more than any others, they weren't alone in this, but more than any others, they practiced what's called syncretism. What that meant is, when they moved to a new neighborhood and took it over, they'd say, now, who is your god? And they'd go, well, uh, uh, Artemis. they go, sounds good, we'll take them. And they would add that god or goddess to their pantheon. So that they had all, and that was called syncretism. Syncretism means you blend different things together and in, in, in a religious sense. And so they would accept all these other gods. Now, you remember the image I just showed you a minute ago of Olympus and all these gods sitting around in the, in the woods and having a good time? This is the Roman pantheon. Look familiar? Because the, this is a different picture. These are the Roman gods because they accepted all of the Greek gods. They ended up with the same kind of images, the same kind of conceptions. In fact, this syncretism was very literally the case. I don't know if you can read all of this, but the number one Greek god, the father of the gods, was Zeus. Well, the equivalent god was Jupiter. Both of them were the father of the gods, the sky god. Their, their wives were Hera in Rome, Juno or in Greece. Juno is the wife of Jupiter in Roman. Aphrodite was the same as Venus. Ares was the same of Mars as Mars. In fact, um, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know when he was in Athens, he preached on Mars Hill. Well, the Greek name for Mars Hill, which is right at the foot of the Acropolis, <laughs> is the Areopagus. Ares, Mars, same <coughs> god, same word. Mars Hill, Areopagus, same place. And so you get Athena and, and Minerva, Artemis and Diana. Sometimes they had a god that they didn't have an equivalent of, so they just accept them as they were. You know, Apollo being one, etc. All of these, Dionysus in, um, in Greek is the same as Bacchus in Rome, etc. All right? And, just like the Greeks, the Romans built a lot of temples. Maybe not quite as many, but a lot of temples. These are Roman temples. Do they look familiar? Yeah. Other than the fact that the Greek temples tended to be open, it would be pillars with just open spaces inside, and the Romans tended to put a box in there because, you know, they were a little more organized. And the other difference is the Romans invented the arch. Probably the only thing that kept the Greeks from being the most powerful empire ever was they never invented the arch. And you think, well, so what? Well, they couldn't build big bridges, and they couldn't build aqueducts without arches. Whenever you see two posts, you know, lentils, with a, with a, a flat beam across the top, that was Greek style. If you see an arch, it had to be Roman, or at least after the Romans showed up, because they invented that. But the basic idea was the temples of the Greeks were modeled after the, or the temples of the Romans were modeled after the temples of the Greeks. But there was a problem with these Greek and Roman gods, and that is, they were not personal. As I said, you couldn't approach them. You couldn't, you couldn't initiate a relationship with those Greek and Roman gods. There also was never a sense of afterlife or immortality in Greek and Roman religion. There had been in Egyptian religion, and one of the reasons why the Egyptians developed a concept of immortality is because they saw life as more of a cycle. Every year, something very particular happened in, in Egypt. What was it? Flood the Nile. The Nile River rose deposited all this rich soil, and then went down again. 
And so, and this repeated every year consistently, the Egyptians developed this idea that there was a cycle of things that was the giving of life and the taking away, and the giving and the taking away, and they developed a sense of immortality, which is why they invented mummifying, because they thought they would mummify the body because eventually it would come back the same way that the Nile would rise every year and then go away. All right? Now, because the Greek and Roman gods did not, you couldn't have a sense of immortality or afterlife, there was not no personal relationship with them, they di you didn't get really any, any joy other than from Dionysus and Bacchus. You, know, you got some joy from them. But otherwise, there was really not any happiness in relating to any of these gods. And um, there was no sense of morality. The Greek gods were the opposite of moral. They were, they were unethical. They liked to do mean things to each other and to people. So there was no motivation for the ethical. And so they developed in ancient times, doggone this thing, excuse me. <laughs> Okay, let's go postpone for six hours. There you go. I don't know why that's doing that. Um, along came the mystery religions. The mystery religions were a development out of in the Greco-Roman world. And again, I doubt that you can read this. You can come up later if you want. But they were particularly, they were secret societies in which you had to be an initiate. Um, and when you became an initiate to the secrets of these cults, you were allowed into their ritual practices. Well, some of the characteristics, <coughs> they were secretive, initiates only. <coughs> Excuse me, not just anybody could wander in here. It was a private club. <coughs> Sorry. They were heavily ritualistic, and along with being heavily ritualistic, there was a sense in which these religions would give you a mystical awakening, a spiritual awakening that none of the other Greco-Roman gods would give you. There was also, within these, there was a sense of the exotic. Most of these mystery religions came out of Persia or out of Egypt, and to the, to the Greco-Romans, this was considered very exotic, very mysterious, this whole mystery of the East kind of thing. Um, most of them offered some kind of immortality. There was some path to the afterlife that was given to you by these mystery religions, and they encouraged relationships. You could, through these ritualistic practices, you could approach the gods and have a sense of them being present with you. And there was a sense of communal life with other initiates. Roman citizens, because everybody took off their clothes and put on the same robes and they stood side by side and sometimes held hands in these rituals, a slave could stand next to a Roman senator and be an equal during the time of the ritual. And there was a great attraction to that. So these mystery religions came along to satisfy the hunger that was not being satisfied by the Greco-Roman gods. Um, they were the cult of Attis, the cult of Sibylle. Sibylle was the mother goddess, the goddess of fertility, which got adopted into this cult status in the mystery religions. The mysteries of Isis, Egyptian, the Dionysian mysteries, the Illusion mysteries, Mithraic mysteries. Mithras was a, a um, Persian god of war that the Roman soldiers especially liked. There were the Orphic Mysteries and the Cult of Serapis. Here are some of the images. Upper left here is the god Mithra killing a bull. You'll see the image of Mithra killing a bull all the time. A bull was the symbol in the ancient times of power, of strength. They talk about, you know, you see symbols of horns whenever they want to represent strength. <clears throat> well, Mithra, the god Mithra, the Persian god, killed a bull by it with his bare hands. And so later on in the Mithraic cult, they had a, they had a, a sacrament-like baptism called the Torobolium, in which the new initiates just joining the cult <clears throat> would come into a cave. Mithra was worshipped in caves. They would come into a cave, and above them there would be a grate, and they would bring a bull over that grate and s cut the bull's um, artery over you, and you would be drenched in the blood of this bull. This was the baptism, the Torobolium of Mithraism. In the center, you have Isis, who is nursing the god Horus. She gave birth to Horus. The upper right is Serapis, one of the gods of the mystery religions. The lower left is the god Attis, who is associate, associated with the, the god of the sun, Helios, the Greek god of the sun. And on the right, the big picture is Sibylle, as it was perceived in the Greco-Roman mystery religions. This is the same goddess as the squat little clay one, mm -hmm. the mother goddess that's passed down through time. All right? So these were the mystery religions. 
I'm giving you thousands of years in just a short time here, so forgive me. And by the way, forgive me for everything I skip. And I'm about to get into monotheism. And if you are Jewish or Islamic or a, you know a practicing, a strongly practicing Christian, forgive me for the things I'm going to leave out because I can't hit everything. Okay. Um, now we want to talk about monotheism, or is it sometimes called ethical monotheism? It's called ethical monotheism because the previous religions, very few of them, with the exception of some of the mystery religions, had any kind of ethical admonitions. The issue of being good as part of your religious practice did not occur under Egyptian, Greek, or Roman uh, paganism. While those polytheisms, as I've said, were primarily based upon perception, what you perceived in nature or natural phenomena, the power that you saw, in the storms and the thunder and the floodwaters, a sense of at least having an understanding of them, if not control of them, was the basis of pagan polytheism. When you get to monotheism, they are not based upon perception, they are based upon a revelation. Every one of the monotheistic religions is based upon God, the belief in one God, having chosen to reveal himself to the followers. Be that Abraham in terms of the uh, Abraham and Moses in terms of the the Jewish faith, um, having re God revealed Himself through the person of Jesus in the Christian faith, we'll talk about that, and having revealed Himself by speaking through the angel Gabriel to Muhammad in the Islamic faith. It is not perception that creates monotheism, but rather revelation in terms of within the beliefs of those faiths. You see the difference? Okay. Now. Let's talk about the first of the great monotheistic religions, which is Jewish monotheism. And I mentioned some of these major events before. I'm going to be duplicating myself over some of the talks because you have to. These are not discrete things. They overlap. Around 2000 BC, or 2091 is the date usually given, God, the one true God, now prior to this everything had been polytheistic. The ancient religions of, of, Meso, of, of the, uh, the Mesopotamian region. Abraham, or Abram, as he was called originally, um, Abraham means honored father. Abraham, his name got changed later, means father of many, because God had promised that he would make him a great people, even though by the time Abraham received this revelation, he and his wife Sarah were thought to be too old to have children. So Abram, uh, and actually I have Abraham twice here, God speaks to Abram later to become Abraham, and says, come, go where I take you, Obey me, I will be your God, you will be my people, and my reward to you is I will make you the father of many, a father of a great nation, and I will give you a land for your people to live in. That was the promise to Abraham. Now, he lived in the land of Ur. You can't, can you see that map? Yeah, Ur. Ur, all right? This is Mesopotamia. He lived in Mesopotamia. So he, Abram would have been one who followed all of those ancient gods that I was talking about before. And so, first, uh, Abram and his father, uh, Terah, move up to, and their families move up to Haran, which is further up into the mount, toward the mountains in the, the northwestern end of Mesopotamia. In Haran, his father Terah dies. Abraham is told by God to follow him, and he is told to go down into the area that then was known as Canaan. We know of as the Levant or Israel or Palestine. It's had many names over its long history. From there, because of a time of uh, difficulty, he goes down into Egypt, spends time in Egypt, comes back you know, to Canaan. But the call, the revelation, the personal communication from the one God, Yahweh is his name in the, the Hebrew Bible. It's the Tetragrammaton, it's a technical name, it's four letters. Uh, you might be interested that ancient Hebrew, like all ancient languages, was not written with consonants, or with uh, vowels. Vowels are breathing sounds. Their vowels are things that you use when you are pronouncing or speaking a language. For a written language, you didn't need vowels. It was all consonants. And in fact, when they were teaching, um, using the original Hebrew text, when they were teaching boys uh, to read from the, uh, the Tanakh, the Bible, in the, in the border, in the edge, they would put what's called vowel points. That is, each word you come to, in order to know how to pronounce it when you're learning it as a child, they would put dots, and those dots represented different vowels. Those are called vowel points. They were added later in the Masoretic text. But anyway, that's a lot of detail. 
Um, and so they'd be reading along, and if the, when, the, when the children were learning to read it and they didn't know how to pronounce it, they'd look over and say, okay, these consonants go with those vowels. You've heard the word Jehovah, right? Jehovah does not exist. There is no such word. Jehovah is taking the vowels uh, from the, the word uh, Adonai, which means Lord. It's a generic word because whenever the Hebrews were reading the text of the Hebrew Bible, they were not allowed to say the name of God. That was part of, of not taking God's name in vain. So they would get to Yahweh, the proper name of God, and they wouldn't say that. They would say Adonai. So the vowel points were from Adonai. But the consonants for Yahweh, if you take the consonants from Yahweh and the vowel points from Adonai, two different words, and put them together, you get Jehovah. So Jehovah is not really a word, although it's become popularly used. I don't have our, you know, a problem with it. But that the, um, how did I get into all that? Anyway, <laughs> wind him up, turn him loose. So Abraham was spoken to by God. He started the, the Jewish faith by hearing the one true God and agreeing to be obedient to that revelation. Then, about 500 years later, we have, again, a revelation. God calls Moses from the wilderness where he was taking care of his father-in-law's sheep after having fled from Egypt. We'll talk about that story later. And he calls, we're going to talk about children of Abraham, and you'll get a lot of the details. Computer's talking to you. I said, remind me in six hours. Oh, yeah, what did you say? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nobody listens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so around 14, 1500, remember I told you 2,000, 1,500, 1,000 is how you remember Abraham, Moses, and David, the three great leaders of the Jewish faith. God speaks. He reveals himself to Moses and says, I want you to go into Egypt. My people are in slavery. I want you to lead them out. This led to... And, and the picture on the left is an image of the burning bush because God spoke in the wilderness to Moses in a burning bush or out of a burning bush. And then God went, led the Israelites out of Egypt in Israel, or out of Egypt into the uh, wilderness of Paran. This is the traditional idea or the historic idea of where the, the exodus would have occurred. This is Egypt. And traditionally, there's a question because they crossed the Red Sea, Scripture says. Well, the, the word um, in Hebrew apparently is more accurately Reed Sea. And so historically, they thought they may have crossed one of these lakes up here and called it the Reed Sea, which got translated the Red Sea later on. And then down through the Arabian Peninsula to Mount Sinai, um, uh, to, or the Sinai Peninsula, excuse me, to what is traditionally Mount Sinai, where Moses received the Ten Commandments, the law, and then back up, and then they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years because the people did not trust God to give them the power to, to take the promised land of Canaan. I, I've always heard the reason they wandered for 40 years is they were being led by a man, and he wouldn't stop and ask for directions. Um, and then they went up into the Holy Land. Now, there is a more, a more recent idea that maybe they actually did cross the Red Sea. There was a miracle involved. Perhaps they crossed the Gulf of Aqba, which is one of the branches of the Red Sea, over into the area known as Midian, which is Saudi Arabia, and then up into wandering around in the wilderness of Zan, and then later came up into the Promised Land. Okay? I don't know. Um, someday I think we'll find out. But... Um, so Moses led the people out of captivity because God told them to, and then he went to Mount Sinai, wherever it was located, and he received the law from God. Moses is the great lawgiver, or actually the receiver of the law. And that law is the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh. That is what Christians call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. It's not called the Old Testament among Jewish people because there's no perception of a New Testament, so you don't have an Old Testament. It's the Hebrew Bible. And so the Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh. Tanakh is actually a combination of three words because the Jews perceive that the Hebrew Bible has three main sections. There is the Torah, the Nevaim, and the Ketuvim. Torah are the first five books, the books of Moses, traditionally written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is called the Law or Instruction, is a better translation, or Torah of Moses. Then you have the Nevaim, which are the prophets, and that starts in the Hebrew the order with Joshua and goes on through the prophetic writings, and then the Ketuvim, the writings, 
which are the writings of wisdom. It includes Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, etc. Okay? Um, traditionally, the books of the Tanakh are kept on scrolls, and the lower right-hand corner is an example of the scroll covers. In synagogues, the scrolls are kept in an ark, and the front of the synagogue are brought out to be read. The lower left-hand side here is what Hebrew, written Hebrew in the Torah looks like. It's not broken up into words in the way we're used to in English, uh, but this is what written Hebrew looks like. Hebrew is an ancient Semitic language, as are many of the languages of the ancient Near East. Many of them are Semitic in their source. And many of the peoples are Semitic. The word Semite comes from the name Shem, one of the sons of Moses. And so all of the Semitic no, peoples, Noah. or Noah, I'm sorry, uh, one, all of the Semitic peoples are perceived as being descendants of Shem, and therefore the name Semite, okay? So, these three great events, first, God reveals himself to Abraham and calls him. Second, God reveals himself to Moses and calls him. And then third, through the prophet Samuel, God selects David to be, young David, to be the king. He was not the first king. Saul was the first king, but Saul offended God. And so, God ordained that David would be the great king of Israel, and then his son Solomon. Under David and later Solomon, we ended up this lower section. The kingdom of Israel was, was significant. It was not one of the major powers, not like Assyria or Babylon, but it was of significance and of some wealth in that period of time. And that was because God called specifically. This is what the United Kingdom of Israel looked like under Saul and David. Um, and that's, that's the, the eastern coast um, of the Mediterranean Sea. We're going to be right there. But then some, some things happened. Um, after David, his son Solomon took over, Solomon, as I said the other day, had a problem with women. He married a lot of foreign wives who worshipped foreign gods. Solomon let them and even encouraged them. He even built uh, sites for worship of these gods that included things like child sacrifice. And so God was offended at Solomon, and that after Solomon, the kingdom was split in two. And this is in the 900s. In 722, the great power that we'll talk about um, after Israel, um, which is Assyria, comes in, destroys the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and then 586 BC, the great power at that time was Babylon. Babylon comes and destroys the southern kingdom of Judah, and they carry the the and Judah is where we get the, the word Jew, by the way, the southern kingdom of Judah. The people of Judah were taken off into captivity, but they were allowed to stick together. Unlike the Assyrians, they spread the people out and, you know, just literally wiped out the people. The Babylonian captivity of the Jewish people was critically um, important in terms of their understanding of their relationship with God. Um, this was the first diaspora, the first spreading out, because a lot of the people taken into captivity, some of them, you know, ran for it and spread out. But the Babylonian captivity had a very significant effect on the Jewish people and on the Jewish religion. First, it staggered them because the Jews were left asking a number of questions. One, does Yahweh God, our God, who we thought is the one God, is he not as powerful as the Babylonian gods since the Babylonians defeated us? Now, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, tells us that, that the destruction of the northern and then the southern kingdom was because of disobedience, not following God as they should have. But the Jews asked the question, is their God more power, are their gods more powerful than our God? Is that why we were defeated? Or, and or, does God no longer love us and no longer accept us as his chosen people? Before the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, there is a very moving passage in Jeremiah where the presence of God that resided in the temple in Babylon, or in uh, Jerusalem, literally lifts up and leaves Jerusalem. The presence of God had departed, and then Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed. So, does God no longer choose us as his people? Thirdly, how do we continue without the things that we know as representing our, our, the revelation and election as the people of God? We don't have the promised land anymore, which was part of the promise to Abraham. We don't have the temple anymore, which was the thing that was built by Solomon, promised through David and built by Solomon, that is the house of God. Um, how are we going to deal with that? This, by the way, is the primary reason. There had been some places of prayer before outside Jerusalem, but this is when the synagogue system really got developed. Without the temple, a place to worship, without a place to sacrifice animals, how do we worship? 
they created the synagogue system, which was not a place for worship, for sacrifice, and they did not have priests. What they had was a place for prayer and a place for study and a place to be community. All right? Critically important, and the synagogue system started here. This was really the beginning of rabbinic Judaism. The rabbis were the teachers. A rabbi is not the same as a priest. A priest was a person from the tribe of Levi who had the responsibility for running the temple and sacrificing the animals and representing the people to God. The Levites were not available anymore, and so rabbis grew up as teachers. This was rabbinic Judaism. And so the people answered the question, how do we worship without the temple? By creating a synagogue system to pray, to study, to learn. This is why learning has always been so important to the Jewish people. And then, how do we keep from being assimilated into a foreign culture, which is what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel, and they did it, again, by having the synagogues as community centers. From that point, um, the, in 538, only less than 50 years later, King Cyrus the Great takes over, conquers Babylon, frees the Jewish people to go back to Israel. Read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and they'll tell you those stories. And then, about 200 years later, Alexander the Great conquers the Persian Empire, spreads the Greek religion, and that was critically important because the, the Jewish people were strongly influenced by this Greek culture. Of course, Alexander um, traveled, spread Greek religion everywhere, including uh, Israel, and in doing so, it caused a strong split in the Jewish people between those who accepted the Greek system, they were called Hellenized Jews, they liked Greek philosophy, they liked the Greek language, they named their children Greek names, versus the Hebraic Jews who wanted to stick with the old way and focus on Hebrew. Then in 63 BC, the Romans conquered <coughs> um, the region for Rome, and in 39 BC, Herod the Great, who was not Jewish, Herod the Great was Idumean, basically from down in Arabia, he and his family. He was named the King of the Jews by the Romans, and he had to conquer the country before the Romans let him be in charge. But this is Herod the Great that you read about in the Bible. So amongst the Jews, um, the last Hebrew prophet had been about 450 B.C., Malachi. That's the last book in the Hebrew Bible, the last book in our Old Testament, uh, the, the Christian Old Testament. And so the last prophet had been over 400 years before the time of Jesus. Where was God in this time, the Jews were asking. Um, and during that time, other influences crept in, especially the Greek influence, the Hellenizing influence. And they ended up with four major parties the Pharisees, Pharisee literally means the separated ones, or the set-apart ones, they maintain a Jewish fundamentalism. They did not go in for the Hellenizing effect of the Greek culture. They didn't like Greek games. They didn't think watching men wrestle nude was a good idea if you were a good Jew. They didn't name their children Greek names, all right? Um, the Sadducees were the second major group. They very much accepted the effect of the Greek culture, the Hellenizing. They were the ones that were the political leaders. They ran the Sanhedrin, the Council of the Jews. They ran the temple. And there were also, the, also theological differences. The Pharisees accepted all of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, as being the word of God. The Sadducees, who really had the political power, they didn't accept all of the Old Testament. Uh, we, well, what uh, we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. They accepted only the first five books, the books of Moses, the Tanakh, and thought the rest of it was not uh, uh, particularly important. You then had the Essenes, which were an apocalyptic separatist group, and the Zealots. The Zealots responded not so much to the Greek culture, but to the Roman oppression. They fought the Romans. The Zealots were believed that the big problem, and this was sort of a religious and political combination, was that we have to get rid of the, of the Romans. Now, the, the, the level of the Greek influence on the Jewish people at that time is reflected on the fact that in the second, by the 2nd century B.C., a lot of Jewish people had forgotten how to read Hebrew. They only read Greek. They only spoke Greek. That's how Greek they had become. And so in the second century BC, um, from Alexandria, a bunch of Greek or a bunch of Jewish scholars were invited to Alexandria to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek, so that all of these Jewish people who couldn't speak Hebrew anymore would be able to read their own Bible. That is called the Septuagint. 
It's called the Septuagint because Septuagint means the 70. And the, it's, sometimes it's abbreviated LXX if you read about it. And the, there were believed to be 70 scholars that came to Alexandria and translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. That Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint, became a dominant force in all, both Jewish and Christian scholarship, from then on. All right? Um, I'm going to give you a few more minutes here. Again, in the first century in Judaism, besides the Greek influence, there is the Roman occupation. The Roman occupation created big problems for the Jews because it reminded them of everything they had experienced in terms of oppression in the past. There's an interesting passage where Jesus is talking to a Pharisee in the New Testament, and the Pharisee says, we are the Jewish people. We have never been conquered by anybody. And you're going, what? <laughs> there were very few times in Jewish history when they were not under somebody else's control. But there was always this sense that no matter if somebody else is in charge, they're only in charge for a little while because we are the chosen people of God, the ones that God has revealed himself to. And so the Roman occupation and oppression, first, it smacked of the Babylonian exile when they were conquered by Babylon. It also smacked of the Seleucid oppression. After Alexander the Great died, he didn't leave a successor, and so all of his generals fought for the whole empire he created. The one who controlled Syria, and a lot of other things for, after a while, was the, the Seleucid uh, descendants, the descendants of, of the general Seleucus. They were so Greek, there was a period of time in which uh, Antiochus the fourth, he called himself Epiphanes, which means a revelation from God, he thought so well of himself and of the Greek culture, he tried to force the Jews to give up their faith and be uh, Greek in their beliefs. He had a, a statue of Zeus put in the temple. He had pigs sacrificed in the temple, unclean animals, and on and on. So the Romans reminded the Jews both of the Babylonian uh, uh, captivity and of the problems they had had with the Seleucids. Economically, the time of the Romans was almost unbearable. There was the temple tax that had to be paid, plus the Romans wanted money. It was a difficult time economically, and so that was a major reason why it was unbearable. There were frequent, frequent rebellions against the Romans. The great Jewish revolt ended up in the late 60s AD. By AD 70, the Romans had had enough, and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Second time Jerusalem was destroyed. First the Babylonians, then the Romans. And that led to some of the same questions that the Babylonians had. And during the time of the Jewish diaspora, the Roman diaspora, after the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, that's when the full rabbinic uh, traditions came about. That's when the, the oral law, they had the written Bible, the Hebrew Bible, but there was also the oral law. And they wrote it down after the destruction of Jerusalem in 200 What's known as the Mishnah, which was the oral law, was recorded. And then later on, the Gemara in 500 AD, those together and some other things make up what's known as the Talmud. The Talmud is the written version of the Jewish law. So the, uh, the, uh, it's the written version of the Jewish oral tradition and law. So the Talmud and the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, together form the authoritative documents for the Jewish people. Um, and in the first century, the Jewish people had always had an expectation. Oh, I've got one missing. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put all these up here and go through them. In the Jewish history, there had always been an expectation of a Messiah. The Messiah was the one that was going to be in the line of David, a descendant of David, who would come, be the new king like David, make Israel great again, free them from their oppressors. Well, during the time of the Roman occupation, the Jews especially were anxious for God to fulfill his promise and send this Messiah. That Jews did not expect that the Messiah would in any way be divine. He was supposed to be a human king. Well, the Christians perceive that Jesus came as the fulfillment of the messianic promise to the Jews. This descendant of David who would be the great king, the difference was the Christians came to understand that he was actually the son of God, that he was divine and not just a human leader in the same way that the Jewish people had been expecting. Palestine in, Jewish, in Jesus' time was, as we've said before, very much the center of the known world. Remember that map I showed you with the three lobes, with Europe and Af Asia and Africa, with Jerusalem right in the center? This was the crossroads of the world. It was a time politically and culturally which was perfect for this new religion to come along. We had the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome. There were no pirates to speak of in the Mediterranean right then. You could travel by sea. 
there were no pirates along the roads. You could travel by road. And in fact, the Roman roads existed, which meant you could go from place to place quite easily compared to 100 years before this or 250 years after this. So the Roman peace, there were no borders. You didn't have to have a passport to go from one part of the empire to another. And so you could travel on wonderful Roman roads. And everyone spoke Greek. Whatever else they spoke, they also spoke Greek. So you could communicate with everybody. It was the perfect time for a new religion to be born and for it to be spread. Um, economically, a perfect time for a message of hope, which Christianity was perceived as bringing. Morally and religiously, the world was tired of all the old religions. The mystery religions, the Greco-Roman mystery religions came along because people were not finding any satisfaction in the old Greek and Roman gods. They were ready for something new. The fact, as I said before, that there were so many Gentiles who were interested in the Jewish faith because they wanted monotheism. They wanted to believe there was one God in charge. They just weren't prepared to do everything that was necessary to become a Jew. They were not prepared to be circumcised. If they were men, they were not prepared to give up bacon. And so the idea that here was a monotheistic religion that comes along, based upon a belief in the same God as Judaism, and yet, those restrictions, the restrictions of the Jewish laws, were no longer there. And so, in the first century as we know it, we have the coming of Jesus, who was called the Christ. The word Christ is a Hebrew word. It is the same as the Jewish word Mashiach, which means Messiah. They both mean the Anointed One. We believe that Jesus was born around 6 B.C., died around 27 A.D., and while Jesus never wrote anything, at least he, he wrote something in the sand, but we don't know what that was, you know, during the, when the woman was caught in adultery, but his followers wrote what came to be known as the Holy Bible, the Christian Bible. Now you'll notice it says here, containing the Old and the New Testaments. The Christian Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. It's exactly the same in terms of the, of the content. It's arranged differently in the Christian Bible than it is in the Hebrew Bible, but it's the same material. And that came to be seen as the Word of God. Christianity spread not, un, not uh, insignificantly due to the efforts of people like the Apostle Paul and the other apostles. Again, a disciple is one who comes to learn. An apostle is one who, having learned, gets sent out. And then Christianity, by 565 A.D., was, had spread further than the Roman Empire. Christianity was illegal until the early 300s, when Constantine became emperor. Later on, it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. But even when it was unofficial and suppressed by the Romans, it grew significantly. Then in 570, the birth of Muhammad that we talked about, um, Muhammad and the giving of the Quran, the recitation of God's word, um, Muhammad spread, and we're going to talk a lot more about this this afternoon probably when we do Children of Abraham. Um, Muhammad spread throughout the Arabian Peninsula, his beliefs, and then after he died, the four wise caliphs, they were called, his immediate four descendants, uh, led a campaign to spread Islam throughout all North Africa, the Iberian <laughs> Peninsula, and Western Europe, all of the Middle East, all the way over through Afghanistan, Asia, and into the borders of India, so that this is what Islam looked like by the um, 750 to 800. And so you have Islam having come in. We'll talk about the beliefs of Islam. I want to mention lastly that the Baha'i faith in the 19th century, one of the basic beliefs of Islam is that um, Muhammad was the last prophet, that he's the last one to bring a revelation of God. Well, in the 19th century, the 1800s in Persia, where there was the Shia branch of Islam, which is much more uh, restrictive, it's, it's much more... Uh, uh, much less lenient than Sunni Islam. In the middle of the 19th century, a man came along whose name was Sayyid al muhammad and he proclaimed that God had given him a new revelation that there was to be a new prophet. Um, he became known as the Bab. Bab means the gate. And it's kind of interesting that he was sort of like John the Baptist. John the Baptist was who one that came before Jesus to announce that he was coming. And the Bab, in the Baha'i belief, is the one who came before the new prophet, whose name was Baha'u'llah. That's where you get Baha'i. So the Bab came along in the mid-1800s. He announced there was a new prophet going to come. He was executed for that. The Shia did not, you know, the, the, the idea that there's a new prophet, a basic tenet of uh, the Islamic faith, is that Muhammad was the last prophet. The Quran was the last revelation. 
Well, in the 1860s, Baha'u'llah came along and announced that he was the new prophet to come. As I say, they were persecuted in Persia. They ended up going to Britain. From Britain, they ended up uh, having problems in coming to Israel. And the Baha'i faith is significant. The, probably the thing you need to know about it is that it believes that all religions are true. That all religions, one of the sayings of Baha'i faith is that all religions are but fingers of the hand of God. And so you will see symbols of, ba of ba the Baha'i faith, like the nine-pointed star, which represents nine of the major religions of the world, as well as nine principles of the Baha'i faith. The ringstone symbol in the center, uh, the top horizontal line represents the, the um, manifestation of God in heaven. The bottom line is the manifestation of God to human beings. The middle line is the revelation God has made to connect the things of heaven to the things of earth, and the, the vertical line that goes through the middle is the revelation of the prophet, the one that connects all of those things together. And then the greatest name, which is Arabic and it translates, uh, O glory of the most glorious, um, that is the name of God. Those are all symbols. This picture, that's the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa. So um, if you don't have other plans, don't stay on the boat, you know, check it out, all right? Ultimately, in the ancient Middle East, this is what the distribution became of modern, the, the modern religions in the ancient Near East. This, all of the brown parts are Sunni Islam, that's 85% of the Muslim faith is Sunni. The uh, yellow here is the Shia faith. Iran is the largest single location of Shia. Um, Western Christianity, or Catholicism as we know it, is the red. The green is Orthodox Christianity, or Eastern Christianity. And then you get other little bits and pieces. This area right here, the dark green, is Judaism, Jewish. There are only 14 million Jewish people in the world. I'll talk about that this afternoon. And yet, even though there are only 14 million Jewish people in the world, they have been awarded almost 30% 30, almost 30 of all the Nobel Prizes. For the, for the population of the Jewish people, the influence that they have had on world history and culture is extraordinary, and it continues to be so today. We'll talk about that this afternoon, all right? This is the way the world looks today. Uh, the, the blue here, the dark blue on the top, that is all Sunni Islam. The lighter blue is Shia Islam. Christianity is represented in the green. Um, the, this brown here is Buddhism. You have the traditional uh, Jewish religion or um, uh, Chinese religions, and then Christianity. Uh, the, the some of these, the, the sort of uh, mud-colored brown, is the combination of other religions and tribal religions. So you get some idea of the spread of religion in the world. Okay, I have once again exceeded my uh, my by forty percent what I promised you I would do. Any questions? Sorry for going so long and for talking so fast, but we're trying to cram a lot of stuff in just a very short time. If you have any questions, please come up and see me this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We will talk about the children of Abraham and get into more detail about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam.